Hi, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of the CCHI Community Conversation. My name is Jorge Ungo. I am the Language Access Advocate at CCHI, and today I am really excited to have three of our CCHI commissioners join us to talk about interpreter skill building. Before I turn it over to CCHI Vice Chair Johanna Parker, I'd like to thank our ASL interpreting sponsor, Masterword Services. With that, Johanna, take it away. Thanks, Jorge. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity, and I'm really excited to be here with uh, my colleagues, Mateo and Fabio, to talk about um, sk interpreter skill building. All three of us are trainers, um, but all three of us are also interpreters. Myself, I've been a Spanish interpreter working in the medical setting for 18 years, and I still interpret at least once a week, uh, in addition to my uh, other, other duties at my hospital. So um, I'm here, we're, we're all here to talk about uh, this topic, both from the perspective of trainers and the perspective of interpreters, and of course, as CCSI, CCHI commissioners. With that, Mateo, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Johanna. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Mateo Rutherford, and I'm kind of in a transition right now. I was manager of interpreting services at uh, University of California, San Francisco Health for 11 years. And so, of course, certification and continuing education was forefront in my mind um, at that point, working with staff interpreters. I'm now um, doing freelance interpreting still, and soon I will be teaching medical interpreting at the local community college. So of course, uh, again, training and performance based and including that skills component into my courses that I'll be offering is, is really uh, front of mind right now. I'm gonna pass the mic over to our colleague, Fabio. Hey, thank you, Mateo. So I'm Fabio Torres and I'm actually a Portuguese interpreter, um, but the other hat that I wear, I'm a director of education and recruitment for translation and interpretation at work. So I have a huge responsibility when it comes to make sure interpreters are qualified, that they know what they're doing, um, to really bring that to the organization where I work every day to ensure that high quality. So today talking about performance, um, it is so crucial that interpreters not only know, um, you know, the, the theory of interpretation or methodology, but that they also have a lot of opportunity to practice those cues that are so needed every day when they're interpreting. So it's really great to be here. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so to get us started, I want to talk about um, performance-based training, not just content-based training, which is, of course, very valuable as well. But why is it important for interpreters to seek out performance-based training? Obviously, as CCHI commissioners, this is something we believe in because um, the commission, uh, the the as part of the continuing education requirements, all of our certificates are required to seek this out. But why is it important to seek out performance-based training, both to fulfill your CCHI certification requirements and just to continue um, building your skills? Yeah, I'll jump in and talk a little bit about that because I think being an interpreter it takes so much from an individual to be able to do that. So you get all kinds of people, right? You get people that um, they've been doing this for a long time. So it kind of comes easily to them that are folks that are just starting. So when, I, when I'm when i training interpreters, I love to use this um, example. So I'm a musician. I like, I, you know, I play the guitar. So, so I'm a performer when I am playing my guitar. If I don't play my guitar for a month, this is what I usually tell interpreters. I get calluses on my finger. It gets really hard for me to move from one chord to the other. Um, but when I am practicing the guitar, you know, every week, um, it's so much smoother that. And the same thing is with interpreting. Interpreting, as we are talking about, it is a performance-based performance, performance -based work. If you're not practicing interpreting every day, right? It's not going to be coming to you as smoothly as if you were practicing. So it's just like any other instrument. You've got to find the opportunity and 
those trainings that are so crucial to help you do that. Um, and, some, and, and specifically to get those acquired skills, such as simultaneous, you know, you have interpreters that need that so badly, but they don't know how to go about, there are no, not, we don't have a lot of trainings out there that are teaching interpreters specifically how to improve um, simultaneous skills or consecutive skills. So, so that's what I think, and that it was so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Fabio, I love that you make that music reference because it's also not enough to just go out there and play the guitar every night, right? When you play, you're performing, you get through it, but, you know, maybe there's a chord that's a little sloppy every time. And unless when you're not performing, you take the time to stop and polish that, work through that segment, work through that challenge, you're not going to you're not going to improve and in fact your skills can even slip while you're doing it every day and i think that the same is very true for in, for interpreters even if you're interpreting every day at work there's always room to continue working on your skills because it, it because when you when you are practicing you're focusing on specific elements and not just on the full yeah. performance and audience experience yeah yeah, I love that analogy because personally, I'm not a musician, but I like to cook. And so I'm thinking about when I try a new recipe, it doesn't always come out great the first time. Um, you know, I learn the recipe and then I tweak it a little bit. And likewise, I feel like if we're taking if we're taking the time out of our busy schedules to take a course on something for a CEU, it's because we're learning something new. Um, either we're learning to interpret for, you know, a cancer genetic appointment or for a palliative care um, assignment or whatever the case might be. And so it's not enough just to read the recipe or just to listen to the theory of, of that particular topic that we are engaged in. We also need to get our hands dirty and start mixing ingredients up in the bowl and seeing how they come out, right? And that's why I think the performance piece is so key. And if we link it back to certification, our certification tests have the um, knowledge test where we're basically tested on what we know about medical interpreting, what we know about the medical culture, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the skills test where we're actually performing interpreting skills and making sure that our skill levels are at, a, at an appropriate um, level for certification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's important to remember that certification is not an end point in many ways, it's a starting point. It is an entry level exam. And then the goal of continuing education is for interpreters to continue building their skills, to continue raising the bar uh, and doing the absolute best we can for our patients. Um, and I love these analogies, going to your cooking analogy, I'm a baker. And so it's not just a matter of following the recipe exactly, even within the following of the recipe, there are sub skills that need polishing. So let's say I've got all my ingredients measured out. I'm putting them in in the right order. But at the end, when I'm folding in the last ingredient, if I just stir it really hard, then I might have ruined the recipe. So there's right. always something, and the same is true with interpreting, there's always something that you can improve. And in fact, yeah. for me, it's something that really drew me to the field. Um, I think it's important for interpreters to have that drive to continue learning both content and vocabulary, but also to continue building skills to really perfect what we're doing. And you know, interpreting is something, it's it's a very instantaneous thing. You know, you've said it and it's gone. Yeah. But at the same time, so we have, and we have to be able to let it go, but then for next time we can make it better. And Johanna, yeah, I just want to kind of, yeah, I just want to bring it up. You know, we were talking about performance-based work. 
It's mm -hmm. a performance work. So think of any kind of, you know, baking, cooking, or singing, playing the guitar, whatever it is, you as an interpreter, we are performing. So mm -hmm. you have amazing performance, performers, and you have uh, performers that are not as great. Those that are amazing, it's because they are so serious about their craft, right? They are mm -hmm. really putting time and energy to become better in whatever they do. It's so funny to watch some actors that you're like, that guy is not as good actor as this other guy. It it's really mm -hmm. has to do with you putting mm -hmm. time and interpreting because it is a performance-based work that we do every day. We have to take this very seriously and uh, you know take those trainings or find ways that we will really um, sharpen those. And I love to see this because, you know, as someone that is working for an uh, organization that we are um, looking for interpreters that are qualified and training interpreters, you know, I am always looking like this interpreter is a star interpreter. I mean, they, they, are, they have come to a place, they need to continue to work, right? But, but it is crucial for interpreters to think, I am a performer. And I have to do everything I can to make my performance be flawless. So mm -hmm. I love that we are here with CCHI and we can do and help them with that. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point. And, you know, I was thinking, Johanna, you probably don't just bake when there's a baking class or when you're watching a baking show. And Fabio, you mentioned that you try to play the guitar constantly. So... That's another really good point for interpreters. Is we can't just practice our skills when we're taking a CEU course, right? We need to be doing this on a daily basis. So I really was curious, what kind of things do you guys do or do you recommend um, to do on a daily or weekly basis to keep your performance at a level that you feel comfortable with? That's yeah, I, that's an important question. And actually, Fabio, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, listen, this might sound absolutely insane and crazy, but I am interpreting all the time. Um, so every day when I have the opportunity just to sit down and watch nightly news, I love mm -hmm. to watch the news. I have my little notepad there. And uh, I'm listening to the reporters that are like doing the different segments of the news. And I'm interpreting. I'm interpreting loud because I'm by myself here um, at the house. So, and then um, having English as a second language, you know, I am still learning English. I will, I will be learning English forever. So, you know, they say words that I don't know. So I write it down and I continue interpreting. And then I write it down another word that I may not know how to interpret. And I continue to interpret what the reporters are saying. And when I always done, I go back and I look at that list and I see, oh my goodness, that are 20 words here and phrases that I am not familiar with. Let me really look the meaning. So that's one of the ways that I do this every day. Um, another thing that I do is the place of worship that I go to. Um, when I arrive there and I have the minister that is, you know, giving the, the sermon, um, I interpret. I, I interpret in my head. And I'm also taking notes since I can't be talking loud, right? I can be speaking because there are so many other people there, but I'm interpreting in my mind. And I'm also taking notes of vocabulary that I do not know. So these are just simple ways that I do this that are more specific ways um, that we can do this like through YouTube, you know, specific uh, uh, content that you wanna, that, that you wanna improve. But every day, that's what I do. And sometimes I do this with my co-workers. <laughs> and they look at me, they're talking to me, and I'm interpreting in my head. And they say, stop interpreting what I'm saying. And I said, sorry, I was just practicing. Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I think, Mateo and Johanna, this has to become part of our DNA. It is, yeah. this is what we do. So it's like, you just sweat interpreting, you do interpreting. Um, and the other thing too, I'm gonna to say, and then I'll be quiet, is that I love to use this analogy a lot. Um, right now, if you were to ask me to run six miles 
I will not be able to. I haven't been running. I am not able to do that. But if you said, Fabio, let's start practicing. Let's let's start walking a little bit and running a little bit, walking a little bit, running a little bit. Probably in three months, six months, I will be able to run a six miles with you. And the same thing with interpreting, although our brain, um, it is not you know, a muscle, but it's an organ, but it functions like a muscle. So the same thing is with interpreting. You know, someone may not be able to have a skill to do um, consecutive or simultaneous right now, but they have to take that challenge to, you got to start somewhere, right? So I love that. And, uh, and yeah. You know, um, you're absolutely right that building skills is not something that can only happen in the classroom. You take a workshop that's an hour and maybe the actual practice time in the workshop is half an hour and doing that a couple times a year is not going to, to it, it may give you some techniques, but yeah. then you have to practice those techniques. Whenever I give a workshop, um, I always frame it as I'm going to give you some techniques for you to practice with. And that's really um, the, the only way to actually take what I'm giving you and use it to improve your skills is to practice it. I would love to say that I practice interpreting every day and I practice my note taking and my simultaneous interpreting and um it's just not the case. And, and I, I also think it's important for us to be realistic because if you think, oh, my lifestyle doesn't allow me to practice every day, so I'm not going to practice, that doesn't mm -hmm. serve you either. Um, so I think it's important to reflect on your practice. Um, so sometimes I notice that my notes are getting really bad. I notice like, oh, I've, I'm just writing full sentences. That's not what I want for my notes. And so when I see that, then I take the time to do a little bit of note-taking practice. Or also before an assignment, um, if I know that I'm going to be doing a simultaneous interpreting assignment, I will practice some simultaneous interpreting ahead of time. And then right before even the actual session, I'll do a little practice or at least uh, shadowing. Um, so, so yeah, just just taking a class isn't enough. Um, the other thing that I think is really an important part of performance-based skill building is that self-reflection and the analysis. You know, interpreting is this massive um, combination of mental efforts, and we need to be able to pick apart what the challenges are and do things to focus on those specific challenges. So. When I think about simultaneous interpreting, I think about coping strategies. Okay, the speaker is speaking really fast and I'm right on top of them. And so I end up having to, to backtrack because the grammar doesn't work. And so then I think, okay, what is my coping strategy to deal with that? Well, leaving more of a lag. So now I'm going to practice just leaving a lag. I'm not going to worry as much about the vocabulary. I'm not going to worry about... Um, about getting all of it. I'm just going to focus on my lag. And so practicing allows us to worry about not just the final product, but all of the sub skills that get us to the best possible final product. What about you, Mateo? Well, before COVID, I used my commute to practice, and I did a lot like uh, what Fabio was describing. You know, I would I would in simultaneously interpret the news on my way into the city, um, and it's exhausting. And so, one thing that I I do want to point out is, you know, don't make it excruciating. You know, do a news clip, and then take a rest and just enjoy listening to the news for a few minutes, and then do another uh, news story. Um, 
it, it's a lot different ball game watching the news than interpreting the news or summarizing the news or paraphrasing the news. Um, you get tired of simultaneous interpreting, listen to a news story, turn the radio off, and then summarize it in 20 words or um, because these are all important skills. It's not just the simultaneous interpreting or the note taking. We need to be able to summarize. We need to be able to condense and and comprehend um, the messages that are coming across. So for those of you who are still commuting, maybe your commute time is a good time to practice some of these skills. I would also add that um, solo practice can be very valuable, but mm -hmm. there is a way to make it more valuable, which is to record yourself and listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. And peer practice is really important. It's very valuable to get feedback from other interpreters. And that can be really scary because interpreters are used to working alone. And so it's it can be scary to feel like we're being judged. Mm -hmm. But if you can work with a colleague that you trust and give each other honest feedback, that can be a really great way to build your skills. Mm -hmm. um, and point. especially if you can find a colleague who has the opposite language combination. So I'm a native English speaker. And if I can find a native Spanish speaker to practice with, that's fantastic because we can support each other linguistically as well. You know, I think that's an important skill in itself to build, which is to feel comfortable interpreting in front of people that understand both languages, because at least I know in the hospital at UCSF, um, you're almost always interpreting in front of somebody who is bilingual. So it's good to feel comfortable knowing that somebody in the room is understanding both the input and the output of your work. Yeah. So let's switch gears a little bit. We've been talking sort of two and four interpreters. Now let's talk two and four trainers. Um, if we recognize the value of performance-based skill building trainings, um, we can also recognize that these sorts of trainings can be harder to create than a strictly content-based training. So what tips do you, Mateo and Fabio have for trainers? How can they include and enhance the performance-based training elements in their content. I I can jump in and, and just talk a little bit about that. I think it's really important to, to partner as a trainer with local organizations that you have that are very diverse, community-based organizations. Um, an example that I can use, you know, here is a where I live here, there is a um, a, a clinic that provides free services to um, individuals who may not be able to pay for the full service or um, or even um, persons that might be in the U.S. and they may not have all their, you know, documentation ready and they want to go to a safe place that they can be checked. So that, that those places are places for trainers to every community has these places that they are looking for um, interpreters to help them. And these are organizations who may not have a lot of money, you know, to pay for interpreting services. So as a trainer, you can you can partner with community based organizations um, to allow um, interpreters during your training program to um build that in there so that they can go there and practice interpreting. Um, that is just a suggestion. I've done that in the past um, with some of the interpreters that I have trained and they they finish that, you know, that methodology and even a little bit of performance in the training, um, but they need a lot more. And these are places they can get a lot of knowledge and polish um, specific skills and not be pressured about, oh, I have to be paid to do this. Um, and so on. So it's, it's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like having a a uh, a practicum aspect of the training. So for, yeah, I agree with you. I think for um, for the basic interpreter training or for certification programs, certificate programs. I'm sorry, um, like at community colleges, 
having that built in where they can go out into the community and actually practice their skills is really important. Um, and a lot of community colleges have that built in with with neighboring hospitals where their graduates will will go out and, and do a practicum um, mm -hmm. at the end of their their training. What I love to do um, if we're talking about like, a, you know, a six or seven hour training, um, I, I love to mix it up so that you don't have all the theory, all the PowerPoint slides in the morning and then all the practice in the afternoon. I like to do a little bit of the theory, and then let's work on some practice exercises around that theory. Then move on to the next chunk of theory and do some more practice exercises. What I found as a trainer is it keeps um, the participants more engaged and you're practicing smaller chunks of theory so that um, you don't forget or fall asleep <laughs> You know, what was that piece yeah. that we learned? You know, you're you're yeah. learning it in chunks. You're chunking the information and including the practices in between the chunks of information. Mm -hmm. I, I find that works really, really well. Yeah, Ag agreed. Um, even if I'm teaching a short workshop, if it's two hours, an hour, I find that there is value in adding even a short exercise so people can apply what they're learning, which will help them get it into their heads a little bit better. You know, even if it's a, and, and this isn't the kind of workshop that I teach, but let's say it's a workshop on a medical specialty on the newest surgery technique in, I don't know, hip replacement. Um, learning it all followed by an actual maybe site translation or short consecutive exercise can really help cement that knowledge. Um, another benefit I think to performance-based training is that it can be, it can, it can make your training more applicable to more levels. And that sounds a little bit funny, but as an advanced interpreter, there are a lot of content-based workshops that I go to where, yes, some of the content is new to me and I'm really happy to learn it, but some of it may be stuff that I already know. Yeah. But if you then include 20 minutes of interpreting practice on that content, no matter what level I'm at, if I'm entry level, intermediate or advanced, I'm going to be practicing and I'm going to be working on my skills. So, um, as we as we continue to grow as a profession, we're going to be seeing more and more advanced interpreters. And the way to make continuing education content for those interpreters is to include performance based elements. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also the adage, you know, uh, the best way to learn something is to teach it. So the advanced uh, interpreters in the classroom almost become co trainers who can yes. facilitate learning for their peers. Absolutely. They're getting, they're giving their peers feedback and, and that's such a good point. That's such a good but point. You know, Johanna and Mateo, as we were talking about this here, you know, just in my head, I'm thinking, you know, it's so funny because, you know, it usually there's a lot of uh, theory, methodology, performance, performance is the last one. And I think that as we look at this today, you know, um, performance should, should be the highest, should have the highest weight um, in, in our profession. Yeah, theory methodology needs to be there. But, you know, when it comes to the performance, um, it needs to be very heavy. And I think that's why we're having this conversation today. And for trainers that will be listening to this, how important it is to really take that into consideration um, for the interpreters that they are training. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not sure how much time we have left, Johanna. Um, I did you have any last comments? You oh, I was make? just thinking, you know, I know you and I both went to the Monterey Institute. And when I was there, we were still using cassette tapes. And you could tell who was the translation and interpretation students because they were walking around all day long with headphones on and a cassette player talking to themselves in weird languages. Yep. <laughs> and it was just constant, constant, constant practice. So absolutely. I really agree with what you said, Fabio. Yeah, absolutely. And we're not expecting interpreters to um, be full-time students the way we were back then, but um, hope that 
we've we've impressed upon those listening to us and watching us uh, the importance of and the value of performance based training. Um, so with that, I thank you both for joining me in this conversation. And I really look forward to seeing the performance based trainings that we uh, see in the in the future. So good to see you both. Thank you so much. Thank Johanna. You. Thank you so much, Johanna Matteo. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.